our lesson for today. We're going to pick up um, the lesson kind of in the middle of the book of Ruth, and we'll kind of then kind of fill in around the edges in just a moment. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, there's a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all of the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different. They do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them. And I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. The royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all of Haman's orders. And dispatches were sent by couriers to all of the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all of the Jews. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth and ashes. And he went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly, but he went only as far as the king's gate. And when Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. And so Hathak went out to Mordecai, and Mordecai told him everything that had happened. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation to show to Esther. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence, to beg for mercy, and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. And then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all of the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And then Esther sent this reply back to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Well, you know, about a month or so ago when I'm, I made the big announcement, I talked about what it feels like to be stuck between a rock and a hard place. And certainly as we just read, my friend Esther is stuck between a rock and a hard place. So, so let's kind of begin this morning by recalling the backstory as we kind of fill in around the edges. Esther's people, the, the Jews, are now living in exile, and they are ruled by the, the, the Persians. God's judgment finally came down upon Judah, upon God's people, because of their disobedience. Now, Persia is ruled by a king by the name of Xerxes. And as the book of Esther begins, let's remember that Xerxes decides to throw for himself this amazing party. It lasts for a whole week. So he invites all of his homeboys, all of the guys of the kingdom, to come. And for seven days, it's drink as much as you want. So you can imagine the revelry that went on. And Finally, in sort of an inebriated condition, he calls for his beautiful queen, Vashti. He wants to show her off in front of all of the guys, a drunken party. So you can imagine what she's thinking about all this. So she refuses to, to, to come. And so 
in a rage, he has her removed and vanquished from the kingdom. So now, a search committee has to be put together. Sort of like, you know, the search committee that we're getting started, but for a whole different reason. And so all over the kingdom, the most beautiful maidens are found, and they are brought into this harem, out of which the next queen will then be chosen. Well, one of the beautiful young women happens to be this young woman named Esther. She's been raised by her faithful, her wise, her older cousin, sort of a surrogate father, Mordecai. Mordecai is a Jew. But Mordecai teaches Esther to kind of keep this whole Jewish thing on the down low. Eventually, of course, the cream rises to the crop in the harem, and Esther is chosen as the new queen of Persia. And to sort of make a, a long story short here, folks, an evil dude by the name of Haman, who hates the Jews, he becomes sort of the right-hand man of King Xerxes. He secretly finds out that Mordecai is himself a Jew, and he kind of has it in for Mordecai. So he tricks the king into signing this edict. This edict states that there's going to be a genocide against all of the Jews of the kingdom on such and such a day. And so as we kind of pick up the story in today's lesson, when Mordecai finds out all of this, you know, he puts on sackcloth and ashes and he is grieving. And so he goes to the gate of the palace to let Esther know. He's not allowed to go into the palace, so he sends word in and Esther finds that he's at the gates. And so she sends her servant, Hathok, out to meet with Mordecai. Hathoth kind of gets the, the gist of the situation, goes in and tells Esther what's going on, and she sends this word back out to Mordecai. Let's hear it again. All of the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death. The only exception being that the king can extend the royal gold scepter to them and spare their life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. So, in essence, if Esther goes before the king unbidden, she might be executed. But then in reply, we hear cousin Mordecai give back a response to her. Three sentences, folks, that may be the most powerful, the most profound back-to-back -back sentences in all of the Bible, not uttered from the lips of Jesus. So let me make that qualification. So we pick up what Mordecai says. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. First sentence. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your, family's, your father's family will perish. Second sentence. Then the third and the best. And who knows but that you have come to such a royal position for just such a time as this. Wow. So as we, we hear these words, what happened? What happened as a result of this? Well, we know that Esther makes a response back. She says, go. Gather together all of the Jews who are in Susa. Fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king. And even though it is against the law, and if I perish, then I perish. Talk about being stuck between a rock 
and a hard place. Well, she does go and do that. And the Lord is with her. And the result of this act of faith is that Haman is found out. He's busted. And the king, as a result of this, sends Haman, ironically, to hang on the very gallows that he had built to hang Mordecai, his enemy, on. And even more, the king rescinds his genocidal order against all of the Jews, and all is set right. I've been thinking this week about a quote by Christian author Chuck Colson, who now is gone from our midst. But he once said that history, it literally pivots on the actions of individuals, both great and small. So Esther finds herself here between a rock and a hard place, and yet in such a time as this, what does she do? She becomes literally a hinge upon which all of history turns, my friends. Yeah, all of the Jews' destiny, it literally hangs on the actions and the decisions of this one single woman. And folks, I'm here to tell you today that the Bible is literally full of such stories, full of stories of people who were in situations where they were faced with a difficult moment, having to answer the call of God, and, and would they stand? Or would they turn tail? And would they run? Let's think about some of those Bible stories. Remember our friend Abraham? God says to him, go to a country that you do not know that's far away, and I will make of you a great nation. So Abraham, this dude is like a prince where he lives in Ur, He's not a pauper. He, he's a very wealthy man. And although he and his wife, Sarah, have no children, the, the years are passing by, nevertheless, they choose to believe God. And so they pick up their whole clan, lock, stock, and barrel, and, and they go. And they face dangers, and they face hardships. And 25 years later, they still have no son. They still have no promised heir. And yet they trusted and, and, and they obeyed and God honored his promise. And as a result, Abraham became the father of the three great religions of the world, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. But I wonder, what if Abraham would have said, heck no, we won't go. History pivots on the actions of individuals, both great and small. How about our old buddy Moses? You remember his story. He, he dodges the, the, the crocodile-infested Nile in this little basket as an infant as the result of the edict of another evil despot. And yet, his basket just happens to float its way into the princess of Egypt's little bathing court there. So Moses is raised, what, as a prince of Egypt. But he grows up, and one day he, he sees an Egyptian attacking one of his fellow Hebrew brethren. And so his, you know, his heritage, it comes leaking out, and in anger, he, he, he kills this Egyptian offender. And now he has to take a, a run for the border uh, to, to Midian. And there God calls to Moses to, to become his people's deliverer. And of course, Moses protests. He says, you know, I'm a stutterer. I, I'm slow of speech. 
how could I ever be the mouthpiece of God? But God says, go. And so Moses goes. And you know the rest of the story. There's the ten plagues and the Passover and the Exodus and the Red Sea and, and the giving of the Ten Commandments. Yeah. History literally pivots on the actions of individuals. But what if Moses would not have obeyed? Well, okay. Chuck Colson said, you know, history pivots on uh, the actions of individuals, both great and small. We looked at two pretty great guys, Moses and Abraham, giants of the faith. But what about the small? Oh, how about a guy by the name of Gideon in the days of the judges? You remember this was a pretty murky and muddy time in the history of Israel. People were, were doing what was right in their own eyes. The patriarchs were gone now. The kings were not yet. And in the meantime, as I've told you before, it can be a pretty mean time. Plus, let's remember, Israel is facing some unique problems. These cruel marauders, the, the Midianites, the Amalekites, they sweep down out of the hills, sort of like locusts they come, and they sack and they pillage all of Israel's crops and, and, and their herds. What to do? Poor Israel. So God, he sends this angel to this timid youth by the name of Gideon and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. <laughs> mighty warrior, says Gideon. Here I am hiding out down in this threshing floor trying to protect just a little grain from these marauders. Besides, I come from the smallest and the least of the tribes of Israel, the half-tribe of Manasseh. And I am the least of the least of the clans of Manasseh. Who, me? A mighty warrior. And not only that, not only am I a nobody, but you, God, you have abandoned us. And yet, nevertheless, the angel says, go. The Lord will strengthen you, Gideon. And so Gideon does go. And he becomes this great judge over Israel. And he does defeat Israel's enemies. And even more than that, get this, folks. He becomes the father of 70 sons. 70 sons. But what if he would have stayed hiding out down in that grain press? After all, history literally pivots on the actions of individuals. Or what about the prophet Isaiah, who when he was called by a host of heavenly angels said to God, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. What if he would have turned tail and run? How things might be different. After all, history, it pivots on the actions of individuals. Or what about his brother, prophet Jeremiah, who when called by God said, I do not know how to speak. I am but a child, a youth. Yeah, what if he would not have answered the call? How things might have been different. History pivots on the actions of individuals. How about in the New Testament? How about the Virgin Mary? When the angel Gabriel came to her and told her that she was to be the mother of the Messiah. What if she would have said, no thanks. History pivots 
on the actions of individuals. How about Peter, this poor Galilean fisherman? Jesus says, come and I will make you a fisher of men. And Peter follows and he goes and he becomes this great apostle and he impacts untold millions. Even our Catholic brethren refer to them him as their first pope. But what if he would have just, you know, sort of stayed in that boat? History hinges on the actions of others. We could go on and we could go on and we could go on. But what about now? What about you in such a time as this? Because I'm going to tell you, the call is going to come. And the call is going to say, step up. Stand in the gap. Serve. Don't turn tail and run. Come together. Overcome. Trust and obey. For I will be with you in such a time as this. You know, I had a dear pastor friend of mine years ago in his church. He burned to the ground. And do you know what he learned from that experience? He used to always tell me, Messner, you know, every church needs a good fire about every 20 years or so. Seems that fire was a test for that church. Would those people arise to the challenge? And they did. They came together and they rebuilt and they overcame. There's nothing like a good fire. To bring people together. And folks, let's realize that that word fire doesn't have to be taken literally. It's a metaphor. I mean, it was literal for him, but I'm not suggesting burn this church to the ground. But it refers to a time of testing. When, when Paul spoke about such a thing in 1 Corinthians, he said, if anyone builds on a foundation, and they use gold or silver or costly stones or wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. And if what they have built survives, they will receive a reward. But if it is burned up, They will suffer loss. Folks, the fire is coming. And what will be the quality of your work for such a time as this? Will it stand the test? Because history pivots on the actions of individuals. We saw that in our video today with Brian and Stacy, a young couple who in faith decided to surrender their life and their resources to the Lord, to put those things at His disposal so that they could help others. I hope you will take the chance this morning to get to know Sonrisa and Tom. Huge step of faith, leaving everything they've known, like Abraham and Sarah, going on this brave new adventure to serve God. How about you? As your church faces such a time as this, what will be your response? Will it be fear? Will it be faint? Will you cut and run? Will you stand and fight? History pivots on the actions of individuals, both great and small. And who knows, maybe you'll be asked to serve or to give in a way in which you never have before. Will you? On this Labor Day weekend, will you labor 
when God calls. And when the fire comes, will you stand the test or not? Amen. I think about our Lord Jesus. I think about the test that he faced on his last night. As he met with his disciples, soon he would go to Gethsemane. Soon he would sweat blood. He passed that test that night, and the fire came. And as he met with them there in that upper room, he took bread, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Eat this. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, after they had supped, Jesus took up the cup, and when he had blessed it and given thanks, he said, This is now the blood of a new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this. Do this in remembrance of me. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.